This is not what I had in mind. I was supposed to graduate from college, find my dream job, and really feel like my life was taking off. Well, I graduated in June. I should have locked out an amazing job designing homes, schools, important buildings. Now it's December. This job market has been impossible. And I don't see it getting better anytime soon. So many people around me have lost their jobs and had to alter their lives. I feel like my life is stuck in neutral. It's driving me crazy. I've been feeling so depressed lately that I don't want to do anything. I don't even want to hang out with my friends. My parents. They tell me I need to get out of the house soon. They think I'm not trying hard enough. I think I am. I've lost count of how many resumes I sent out, how many application forms I filled out, but I haven't heard back from anyone, not even to say that they got my application. I just don't know what to do anymore. This is going to be the worst Christmas ever. I thought I had it all figured out. Saving money for my wife so that I could retire by the time I was 55. How was I to know that the bottom would just fall out of all of my finances? I couldn't wait for the day that I could hear God say, you have done good, been a good and faithful servant, not just to me, but to your fellow man. Be at ease with your wife and for the rest of your days. Now, I guess all that's gonna have to wait. It started with the medical bills. My mom had a tough year already. You know, with her illness and my dad passing away. You know, I'm her only son. We're not wealthy, but I felt obligated to take care of her. I mean, what else could I do? And my son, he, he's in his second semester at USC. We always said that we never let tuition get in the way of his education. I just, the bottom fell out. After 20 years, because of the struggling economy, the job that I had, used to have, is gone. No benefits, no pension. I just, You know, I think about all the things that are going on in my life right now. I ran out of gas on the way to church yesterday. What kind of Christmas is it going to be if I can't afford to buy Christmas presents? I recently came home from a long day at work and my husband Craig was going out with some friends for a couple of hours so I thought, oh, I'll have some time to go online, check up on a present I had ordered him for Christmas. And I opened the computer, the internet browser, and I saw that his email was still open. And I felt a little guilty because I want to give him his privacy until my eyes fell on one line that said, you have a new message from Ashley Madison. I had heard of this website. Um, it just filled me with disgust when I first heard about it. You know, some online website where people can develop profiles so they can search for an affair. And I, I couldn't believe that I saw that in Craig's inbox. So uh, I clicked on it, I had to, and uh, he wasn't going out with friends that evening. He was going to see a woman instead. I didn't know what to do. I, I, I froze and I, I wanted to cry and scream at the same time. I, I 
wanted to tell somebody, my mom, my friends, but I, I couldn't, I was too embarrassed. Everyone thinks we have the perfect marriage. I thought we had a perfect marriage. And then we were supposed to go to Christmas Eve services together, me and Craig. That's the last thing I want to do. I don't even want to see his face. I don't want to be in the same room with him. I look at him and I think, how could you? This is going to be an awful Christmas. Christmas time was her favorite time of the year. From cooking to decorating to visiting family, she just loved it all. Her enthusiasm was so contagious. I actually started to look forward to Christmas tree hunting. When I brought home that Christmas tree, she, her eyes would light up like a little kid's. I already could tell she knew where she's going to put each and every ornament. When Christmas Day came around, our house would be filled with decorations, cards, pictures from loved ones, and of course those beautifully wrapped Christmas gifts. Christmas carols would be heard throughout the house. It's a wonderful life to be playing on TV. Everywhere you look reminded you that it was Christmas. But this year just won't be the same. Even if I tried every moment to try to recreate what she did to make this time of year special, it would never be the same. She made Christmas special. It was her love that made our home, our lives special. Now I have to pretend that Christmas is special for the sake of our five-year-old daughter. How can it be special? My wife is dead. It will never be special again. What was the worst Christmas you've ever had? Is the one coming up shaping up to be the worst one you've ever had? Maybe because you lost a loved one this year? Or maybe because you lost your job and you don't have any money to buy presents? Maybe this year is shaping up to be the worst Christmas you've ever had because you or somebody in your family was diagnosed with cancer? And you've just been battling, trying to keep your loved one alive. Maybe this is going to be a bad Christmas for you because your parents got divorced. And so for the very first time, you're not going to have Christmas as a family. Maybe you, your dreams and your hopes for having a family were completely dashed this year because you found out that you'll never be able to have a baby. Think about that. When was the... What's the worst Christmas you've ever had? You know, there's so many reasons why Christmas can be horrible, that it can be bad. There's so many reasons why that can be the case. Maybe you're just constantly at odds with your, your spouse or your significant other. Boy, is that another reason why your Christmas can be lousy? Yeah, it's another, it's another reason. You know, if there was anyone who ever had a reason to have a horrible Christmas, it's this man right here. This is Saeed Abedini and his wife and children in happier days. And of course, you probably recognize where they're at. Saeed is a 35-year-old Iranian-American pastor. He converted from Islam to Christianity when he was 20 years old. And then he realized that God had a greater call in his life to go into ministry. And so he became a pastor, studied and became a pastor. And he felt like he wanted to minister to his own people in, in Iran. So he'd go back there. 2012, he went back to Iran. He was there to build an orphanage. And then the Islamic Republican Guard came in. They found out they was there and they arrested him. And he's been there ever since. The very next year, he was convicted by the courts, sentenced to prison for eight years simply because he was a Christian. And he was sent to the Rajai Shahar prison, which is the most notorious prison in all of Iran. The, their worst criminals 
are kept in this prison. In fact, it's, it's so bad there. Prison was built for 5,000 inmates, but it houses 20,000. One toilet for every 70, 170 inmates. One bar of soap for every 500 prisoners. One blanket for every five to six prisoners. And every five prisoners is confined to an area that's 53 square feet. My office is twice that size. It's horrible. It's terrible there. A few years ago, one of the prisoners there, Dr. Saeed Masuri, is a political prisoner there in this prison, was able to get a note out, get a, get a letter out to the world. Here's how he described the, the conditions there. He said, the prison is much like the hell depicted in movies, full of fire and smoke. A world filled with burnt, black, disheveled faces, naked bodies covered with sweat and red marks from the sting of lice. A world filled with torn trousers, scraps of which are used as belts, bare and filthy feet, clothes worn inside out and covered with lice, torn, mismatched slippers. A world in which you're exposed to polluted air, the extreme smell of putrid waste, overflowing sewage from toilets, the toxicity of dry vomit, infectious phlegm, and the body odor from bodies in close proximity, rarely given the opportunity to bathe, all coming to a climax with the smell of urine by those who are unable to control themselves. Faces gaunt with malnutrition, yet hidden behind dense beards and disheveled hair, heartbreaking coughs as a result of lung problems caused by contaminated indoor air, unrecognized bodies that are associated with starving children in Africa, masses of prisoners across the corridors looking as though they are dead, heat-stricken with soulless eyes staring at the walls and the ceiling. That's what it's like there. And many of the male prisoners who are unable to fend for themselves, the younger ones, the weaker ones, they are raped systematically every night. Night after night, they are raped by the other male prisoners. That's been the setting for Saeed's last two Christmases. That will be the setting for his third Christmas. I mean, can you imagine celebrating Christmas under those conditions? It's unimaginable. Can't even imagine what that would be like. It's going to get worse. Amazingly, last Christmas, 2014, he wrote a letter and was able to get it out to his family and to his friends. And I want to read just a part of what he said. Here he is in this prison. Here's what he wrote. Merry Christmas. I just stopped right there and I thought, how can he even say that? But he said, Merry Christmas. These days are very cold here. My small space beside the window is without glass, making most nights unbearable to sleep. The treatment by fellow prisoners is also quite cold and at times hostile. Some of my fellow prisoners don't like me because I'm a convert and a pastor. They look at me with shame as someone who has betrayed his former religion. The guards can't even stand the paper cross that I have made and hung next to me as a sign of my faith and in anticipation of celebrating my Savior's birth. He's going to celebrate his Savior's birth? He continues, This is the first Christmas that I am completely without my family. All of my family is presently outside of the country. These conditions have made this upcoming Christmas season very hard, cold, and shattering for me. It appears that I am alone with no one left beside me. That's part of what he wrote at the very beginning of the letter. And his letter is a sober reminder that not every Christmas is merry. You know, hopefully you received a Baywatch when you walked in, and inside of that Baywatch we have a, a, a sheet there with some notes on it. If you'd like to follow along, we've got verses listed there for you just to make it easy for you to, to track with what we're teaching here today. But you might want to fill this in. Christmas isn't always merry. His, his letter is a reminder that Christmas isn't always merry. Sometimes Chris isn't, Christmas isn't what we, we want it to be. According to the National Institute of Health, the depression among people skyrockets in December and at Christmas. It gets worse. People get depressed at Christmas. And I think it's because Christmas tends to remind us of what we don't have. It reminds us that we, that we don't have love. Or it reminds us that, we don't have, that we're not married. Or it reminds us that we don't have money and we, have, we don't have presents to give away to people. It reminds us that we don't have good health, and so it, it, it reminds us of all these things, and so we get depressed. And I think, I think the problem is this. I think part of the problem is that we've been brainwashed. We've been brainwashed into thinking that Christmas is the, the hap, happiest season of all. We sing about these things. 
We've been brainwashed into thinking that Christmas is chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Jack Frost nipping at your nose and tiny tots with her eyes all aglow. That's what we think Christmas is. We think that Christmas is all about fun and family and all these things. And, and it, it's become a feel-good holiday. But the truth is, it doesn't always feel good. Christmas doesn't always feel good. I believe this Christmas there will be a lot of people, even people we know here in our own church, for whom Christmas may not be merry. I mean, just, just to give you an example, tomorrow, Monday morning, here it is, we're just four days away from Christmas, five days away from Christmas now. But Monday morning, I will be, tomorrow morning, I'll be, I'll be officiating a funeral service for somebody who lost their mom. Won't be very merry for, for that family. On Tuesday morning, Pastor Greg is going to be officiating a service for a 28-year-old who was shot and killed, shot 11 times. His family member attends our church. Can you imagine what Christmas will be like for them? Christmas isn't always merry. You know, Saeed's condition, his situation started, he started got him to start thinking about all you do in prison is try to defend yourself, but it, God to start thinking about the very first Christmas. Here's what else he wrote. Take a look at this. He, he wrote this. These cold and brittle conditions have made me wonder why God chose the hardest time of the year to become flesh and why he came to earth in the weakest human condition as a baby. Why did God choose the hardest place to be born in the cold weather? Why did God choose to be born in a manger in a stable, which is very cold, filthy, and unsanitary with an unpleasant smell? Why did the birth have to be in such a way that it was not only hard physically, but also socially. It must have brought such shame for Mary and her fiancé that she was pregnant before marriage in the religious society of that time. I mean, he asked some great questions. Have you ever wondered these things? Why would God come at the harshest time of the year? Why would he send his son to the harshest place in the world under these circumstances and these conditions, born in a stable, born and put in a manger? Have you ever wondered those things? So I want you to write this one down. The first Christmas wasn't so merry. The very first Christmas wasn't merry. It did, the first Christmas didn't get off to a very good start. First, because it was shrouded in scandal. Did you know that Christmas, the very first Christmas, it was shrouded in scandal? You can write that one down. You know, see, the story goes like this. Mary was betrothed to Joseph. She was betrothed to Joseph. That simply meant in Hebrew customs, they, they didn't get engaged. Uh, a betrothal, a betrothal would, it was a lot more different. It was, it, was, it was legally binding, which means if you were betrothed to somebody, you were legally bound to her or you were legally bound to him to marry. And the only thing that could separate you would be a divorce, even though you were not allowed to have sexual relations until you were officially married. But once you were betrothed, it was as if that relationship was was legal. And if one or the other party was unfaithful in that relationship, then you could seek a divorce. Well, the unthinkable happened. Mary and Joseph are betrothed to one another. They're legally bound to Mary. They're not having sexual relationships. And then she becomes pregnant. The unthinkable happens. She becomes pregnant. Under normal circumstances, she would have said, Joseph, I'm pregnant. And they would have rejoiced, and they would have been happy, and they would have celebrated. You're going to have a baby. You're going to have, I want to be a daddy. You're going to be a mommy. That wasn't the case at all. There was no celebration. There was no, no tears of joy. I mean, usually when, you have a, when you're going to have a baby, you, you celebrate. I remember when God told Abraham. Abraham was 90 years old. God told Abraham that he was going to be a daddy. Abraham was so overjoyed, he laughed. He thought it was funny. Now, if God told me that I was going to have a baby when I was 90 years old, I wouldn't laugh. I'd cry. But he laughed because it's a time of celebration. I remember when Cheryl told me that, that I was going to be a daddy. We celebrated. I cried. It's such a great time. It's a reason for celebration. In fact, the other day I saw a video of a father and a mother telling their three children. They had three children. They told their three children that they were going to have one more. Take a look at this. This is so great. Okay. Yeah, no. Um, actually, we have something to tell you guys. Mama, listen. I don't think I want to hear it. You don't want to hear it? <laughs> okay. We have a surprise for y'all. 
Yes. We're gonna have a baby. Apparently not. She pulled a yup, they pulled a mom on granddaddy. Look, 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 somebody just take a picture. Mommy and Daddy said, "You gonna have a baby brother or sister? You want a baby brother or sister? Happy tears! Please tell me those are happy tears. Okay. <laughs> We're gonna have a baby. A real one. A real one. A real one." And she couldn't, the daughter couldn't stop crying. You know, when Mary told Joseph that she was going to have a baby, there's no crying. There's no celebration. You know what he decided to do? What he was legally allowed to do. Decided to get a divorce. Okay, this relationship's over. I'm going to get a divorce. Take a look at the next verse, Matthew 1. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Will you circle the word shame there? Mary's pregnancy was scandalous because she wasn't supposed to get pregnant. She wasn't supposed to be having sexual relations with anyone, let alone Joseph. And of course she wasn't, but she became pregnant. And there were no tears of joy. There was no tears of celebration. She became pregnant. How did she become pregnant? The Holy Spirit came upon her. The baby was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And that's why the angel of the Lord had to go to Joseph and tell him, Joseph, don't divorce her. I want you to marry her because the baby she's carrying has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that the baby belongs to God. It means that the baby belongs to God, and, the, and it means the baby is God. That's what it means. The baby is God. But from the first day, from the very first Christmas, it was shrouded in scandal because this wasn't supposed to happen. Second, the first Christmas wasn't so merry because it was also bathed in terror. Bathed in terror. When King Herod heard that a baby was, was born in Bethlehem, whom the Magi call the king of the Jews, he went ballistic. He said, I'm the king. No one else is going to be the king. I want every baby killed. I want every baby dead. Because he was threatened. His throne was threatened. He was afraid of this king. And so he ordered the massacre of every baby boy, two years old and under, figuring if I kill them all, then that should kill this king, whoever he is. And that night that was wailing and weeping unlike anything that had ever been heard since the time of, of the Exodus when all the firstborn were killed by the angel of death when Moses was there in Egypt. I mean, can you imagine if that happened here? If some government official ordered the, the massacre of every baby in Torrance or in the South Bay? I mean, imagine the uproar, imagine the fear, imagine the terror that we would be living under here. Matthew 2.16 says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem. In all that region, it wasn't just Bethlehem, but in all that region, who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men, the king went berserk, and terror engulfed the night. You know, for the very first time in our lives, and I think this is true, we are beginning to to understand what it's like to live under fear and under terror. I think for the first time, we're beginning to, to think about that. We're, we're beginning to wonder. Last week, all LAUSD schools were shut down. I know some of the teachers, some of you teachers work in LAUSD schools, and you were telling me about that. The, the week before that, and I believe even this last week, Miracosta High School, which is right here in Redondo Beach, and we have some students who go there, shut down for three days, for three days because of a bomb threat. 
It's amazing what is happening. For the first time, we're beginning to sense what it's like to live under terror. And that's what it was like in the very, the very first Christmas. It was bathed in terror. Third reason why the very first Christmas wasn't so merry was because it was cloaked in obscurity. It's cloaked in obscurity. Now, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I was born in Isleta, Texas. Uh, any Texan? I'm a Texan. Any Texans here? Oh, we got one Texan here. Mary's a Texan. We got a Texan. Oh, Chris is a Texan. All right. So we got some, we got some Texans here. We have three Texans here. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not alone. I was born in Texas. In fact, I was born in Isleta, Texas, which is just outside of El Paso. El Paso is the armpit of Texas, but I, it's so small. Isleta is so small, you can't even hardly find it on most maps, but I found one on, on this map here. And there's a little tiny red dot on the very west end of Texas, and that's Isleta, Texas. It's right next door to El Paso. And that's, that's where I was born. El Paso, I mean, Isleta was founded in 1681 by a bunch of Spanish conquistadors and Pueblo Indians in Allen Hamada. And um, it's considered... <laughs> It's considered the oldest settlement in Texas. At the time I was born, my parents were living in Dell City, Texas. So if you, if you went from there, from, from East Leda, 90 miles, 96 miles east, straight shot, that's Dell City. This is Dell City. And this is where my parents were living at the time I was born. So they had to drive 96 miles to the, to the hospital so that, I can, so, the, so that my mom could give birth. And yes, believe it or not, I was born in a hospital. But they lived in an adobe hut there in Dell City, no electricity, no running water. The way they, uh, they kept the food cold was with an ice box, which means they'd have a box and you put ice in it, and that's how it kept the food cold. That's how they did it, kind of like an ice chest. That was their refrigerator. Kerosene lamp, their closest neighbor was eight miles away, and there were 180 people living in Dell City when I was born. I was the 181st person living in Dell City after I was born. And when I was born, there was no hoopla. There, were no, there was no baby shower because there was no one to throw a baby shower for me or my, my parents. There, there, was no, there were no Instagram posts about my arrival, no Facebook posts, no Snapchat, nothing about, about Gary Shiohama coming in the world. It was, it, was, it was worse than that when Jesus was born a few years before I was. Take a look at Luke, Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And it says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now notice it says they laid him in a manger. They laid him in a manger. Now Jesus wasn't born in a manger. Okay, I want to make that real clear. He wasn't born in a manger. A manger is basically, is no, is no, nothing less than a feeding trough. All right, a manger is not a, is not a stable, it's not a barn. He was, Jesus was likely born in a barn and a stable of some kind. But the feeding trough is what they laid him in. In other words, the feeding trough was his crib. That's what they put him in. They wrapped him up and they put him in a crib, which was the feeding trough, which is what the animals drank their water out of or ate their food out of. And that's what he was in. So it was totally obscure. The first Christmas was totally obscure. I mean, in fact, they couldn't find a room at the inn, and that's why they went to a barn or some kind of a stable. You know, earlier, the first Christmas, okay, so the first Christmas, by reminder, Cloaked in obscurity, shrouded in scandal, bathed in terror. That was the first Christmas. That's why it wasn't so merry. Now, earlier this week, Hollywood rolled out the red carpet. They, they rolled out the, the world premiere for Star Wars The Force Awakens. Awesome movie. <laughs> and and, and uh, the world premiere, I mean, it was something else. Hollywood, I mean, they shut down Hollywood Boulevard four days before the event even started. Rolled out the red carpet, the whole thing. It was an amazing event. They pulled out all the stops. They spared no expense. R2 and 3PO were there. It was amazing. Darth Vader and the stormtroopers all showed up marching down the red carpet. Hans was there and Leia were there. Oh, it was amazing to see. Anyone who was anyone was there, including me. I went as an X-Wing fighter pilot. <laughs> I'm kidding. I wish I was there. Start. It's amazing what Photoshop can do, huh? make you live out all these fantasies. And then, but I do know this. There was an after party, and it was glitzy. 
and it was glamorous, and there were limos, and everyone, they were, the ladies were wearing their, their gowns, and the guys were wearing the tuxes except for Hans, and, and every media outlet in the galaxy was there to record the event, and they spent millions just on this one event, spent millions of dollars. Compare the world premiere of Star Wars The Force Awakens to the world premiere of God's Son. No comparison. Compare the two. When Jesus was born, nobody came. Oh, a few magi, a few shepherds, a bunch of animals, a, a, maybe a donkey, a cow, a bunch of pigs and goats, a few chicken thrown in. It was, it was nothing. There was no red carpet rolled out, no glitz, no glamour, no paparazzi. I mean, think about when this, another prince came into the world, when he was introduced to the world, Prince George, his parents, William and Kate. I mean, this is, this is even better. And then when they came, up, came out of the hospital and said, this is our son, the world premiere of Prince George, they looked across the street and this is what they saw. Thousands of reporters there to record the event. This was the throng they faced. And yet the world premiere of God's son, when he came out, nothing. Nobody. It was simple, obscure. Jesus was born to a teenager who was a virgin. It was scandalous because she got pregnant without having sexual relations with a man. Jesus was born in a barn, laying, laid in a, a feed trough. No red carpet, nothing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. God could have sent his son to planet Earth in a whirlwind if he chose to do so. He could have delivered him to us in a consuming fire or in a blaze of glory if that's what God wanted to do because God can do anything. But he didn't do any of those things. Instead, God humbled himself. He humbled himself. Here's how Philip Yancey described what God did in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew. Here's what Philip Yancey said. He said, the maker of all things, the creator of the universe, shrank down down, down, so small as to become an ovum, a single fertilized egg barely visible to the naked eye in Mary's womb. That's what God did. He humbled himself. The God of the universe, the creator of all things, made himself so small that he could come to earth and be born of a virgin and be born in human form. You know, he came to us as one of us. He came to us as a man. And if you don't believe me, John 1.14 says, and the flesh, now the Bible says, and the, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Will you underline word became flesh? That word, word, Greek word logos, it refers to God. That word, the word refers to God. If you don't believe me, you, you jump up to verse 1. This is verse 14. You jump up to verse 1 in the same chapter, and it says this, John 1, 1. We'll put it up here for you. It says, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, when everything was created, there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Would you underline the Word was God? The Word was God, and, and verse 14 says, and that Word became flesh. In other words, God became human flesh. He became a human being. It's amazing. You think about that. It is amazing. The creator of the universe became very, very small. Became a baby. That was Jesus. And Jesus came into the world. He was fully God. He was fully man. It's one of the great mysteries, one of the great miracles of the Bible that the God of the universe would become a human being. Why? Why would he do that? Why was he born that way? Why did he become a man? One simple reason. So he could die. Christmas is all about Jesus coming to earth so he could die. You see, God can't die because God is a spirit. You can't kill God. Nobody can kill God because he's God. But Man can die, and he came as a man because man can die. All men die. Every one of us is going to die one of these days. God came as a man so he could die because God knew that dying was the only way that he could save us 
from our sins. 1 Peter 3, 18 says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. Will you underline a couple things here? Right, underline Christ also died. Christ also died. And then circle the word sins. Christ also died for sins. And then underline this, that he might bring us to God. Underline that he might bring us to God. Christ died for our sins. You know, sin is the biggest problem we have today. The biggest problem we have today is not ISIS. The biggest problem we have today is not our economy. The biggest problem we have today is not climate change. The biggest problem we have today is sin. Sin, you can trace every problem we have in this world. You can trace every problem you have in your own personal life. You can trace it all back to sin. Whether it's greed, whether it's selfishness, whether it's pride, whether it's murder or envy or hate, whether it's prejudice or jealousy, or whether it's addiction, whether it's molestation, whether, whether it's divorce, whether it's adultery, whether it's bullying, whether it's lawsuits, whether it's mass shootings, whether it's bomb threats, you can trace it all back to sin. We're all sinners. Every single problem can be traced back to sin, and here's the problem with sin. It'll suck the life out of you. It sucks the life out of you. Annie Dillard wrote a book called Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, in which she describes seeing this frog as she's walking along this creek. She, see, she comes upon this frog, and, and the frog is half in, out, in the water and half out of the water, just sticking out. And she, she watches this frog, this little green frog. Here's what she wrote about what happened. She said, as I looked at him, he slowly crumpled and began to sag. The spirit vanished from his eyes as if snuffed. His skin emptied and drooped. His very skull seemed to collapse and settle like a kicked tent. He was shrinking before my very eyes like a deflating football. Soon part of his skin, formless as a pricked balloon, lay in floating folds like a bright scum on top of the water. It was a monstrous and terrible thing. An oval shadow hung in the water behind the drained frog, and then the shadow glided away. You see, what Annie didn't realize when she saw this, what she didn't, re didn't realize when she saw this was that the, the frog fell victim to that oval shadow. And that oval shadow was an epimus beetle. An epimus beetle, they prey on frogs. It latches onto a frog like this. And then it begins to suck the juices out of that frog until there's nothing left but skin. That's what a frog, that's what the epimus beetle does. And this is a perfect illustration of what sin does to man. It literally sucks the life out of us. It sucks the vitality and the power out of us. It steals our joy. It destroys our marriages. Sometimes it'll end up, it will end up in jail because of it. It breaks up our families. It causes people to go off and follow after all kinds of evil things, bad things. That's what sin does. It sucks the life out of us. And the problem is every one of us is, sin, is a sinner. Every one of us has got sin in our lives. You don't need to teach a two-year-old to sin. They've got it. When they're born, they've got that sin nature. That's why they're so, that me, 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 they, they want everything. Everything is about them. And of course, we become adults, and, and we're the same thing. Teenagers are the same thing. Even pastors sin. We got four pastors on our staff. They all sin. They're worse sinners than I am. But, <laughs> but we all sin. That's the problem. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all sin. That's the problem. And eventually, here's an even greater problem. If we don't deal with our sin, then one day it's going to kill us. Your sin will kill you. It will kill you. Take a look at James 1.15. And it says, And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth what? Death. Sin will bring forth death. Now, this is not physical death because we know that everybody dies. But what James was speaking about here was spiritual death. Eventually, sin brings forth spiritual death, which means everybody, spiritual death is basically when you're separated from God. See, physical death will separate us from each other, 
right? If I die, I'm separated from you. I'm separated from my family. That's what death, physical death does. But spiritual death will not only separate you from your loved ones, it will separate you, and even more importantly, it will separate you from, from God. And, and spiritual death is worse than physical death because the one thing you don't ever want, one person you don't ever want to be separated from is God. It's the worst thing that could ever happen to you is to be separated from God because God loves you. There's nothing worse than that. God knew that the only way that he could save us from our sins, and we're all sinners, he knew that the only way he could save us from our sins was if his son died on a cross for our sins. That's why he sent Jesus. The only way we could be saved, and that's why he was born a man. I love the way Pastor John MacArthur described it. He, he wrote, those soft little hands fashioned by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb were made so that nails might be driven through them. Those baby feet, pink and unable to walk, would one day stagger up a dusty hill to be nailed to a cross. That sweet infant's head with sparkling eyes and eager mouth was formed so that someday men might force a crown of thorns onto it. That tender body, warm and soft, wrapped in swaddling clothes, would one day be ripped open by a spear. You see, Jesus, the baby, came as a man to die. That's what Christmas is all about. He came to die. And he came to die so that he went, bring us to God. First Peter 3, 18, again, I ask you to underline. He died so that he might bring you to God. More than anything else, God wants you to be with him. Have a relationship with him. This is, not, this is not about becoming religious. This is about having a personal relationship with the living God. So you can write this one down. This is your final point. Christmas can always be merry. Christmas can always be merry because Christmas isn't about your personal circumstances. Christmas isn't about whether you have money this year to buy presents. Christmas is not about whether you are healthy this year. Christmas is not about whether you're getting along with members of your family or your spouse. Christmas is not about whether you have love in your life this year. Christmas is about God sending his one and only son. This autumn, awesome and mighty God making him smell small, small, small so that he can come and fit into your heart if you ask him to. Christmas is about God coming to earth as a human being so that he could die for you. Let me ask you something. Have you ever asked Jesus to come into your heart? Have you ever told him that you believe in him, that you believe he was the son of God, that you believe that he, he, he died on a cross for your sins? Have you ever asked God to come into your life? Have you ever asked Jesus to come into your life and forgive you of your sins? If you've never done that, do that today. It is the greatest thing you can ever do. So you can have a relationship with God. Jesus came that he might bring you to God. And I believe he brought you here today that you might have a relationship with God. Here's how Saeed Abedini closed his Christmas letter last year. He wrote, Christmas means that God came so that he would enter your hearts today and transform your lives and replace your pain with indescribable joy. Christmas is the manifestation of the radiant brightness of the glory of God and the birth of a child named Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Christmas is the day that the heat of the life-giving fire of God's love shone in the dark, cold, wintry, frozen hearts and burst forth in this deadly, wicked world. That's what he wrote. That's what Christmas is all about. I can't even begin to imagine what it's been like for Saeed Abedini there in that prison somewhere in Iran, Tehran, Iran. In recent months, it's been reported that, that he's been beaten by guards, that he's been beaten by other inmates. It's been reported that he's in very bad health, and the entire time the government refuses to give him any kind of medical attention. So he lies there listless, maybe feeling hopeless. And I want to just encourage you, as often as you think about him, as often as you think about your own circumstances, pray for him. Pray that God would strengthen his faith and protect him from evil. And somehow pray that he can be delivered out of all that and, and brought home. I have a hunch 
that this Christmas for Saeed is still going to be Mary because Christmas is about Jesus and he has Jesus. What would he do without Jesus? In fact, what would we all do without Jesus? We would be so lost, wouldn't we? We would be so hopeless. I don't know what your Christmas is shaping up to be like this year. I don't know whether you have money for presents. I don't know whether you lost a loved one this year. I don't know, maybe your heart's just breaking because it's Christmas and you don't have the things that you think of when you think of Christmas. If you make Christmas about your circumstances, then you might have a lousy Christmas. But if you make Christmas about Jesus, your Christmas will always be merry. How, how can your Christmas be merry? Well, you've got to receive the gift. You've got to receive the gift of God's Son, Jesus Christ. John 1.12, your final verse, says this. John wrote, but to all who did receive him. Will you circle the word receive? To all who did receive him, the pronoun him refers to Jesus. To all who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Apostle John said that the one who receives Jesus is the one who has the right to become a child of God. You see this notion that everybody is a child of God? Everybody, you hear that all the time. Oh, we're all children of God. We're all children of God. No, it's not true. It's not true. We're not all children of God. Everybody in the world is not a child of God. Only those who receive Jesus are children of God. That's what this says. Only those who receive him. And how do you receive him? The pre, by the way, the prerequisite for receiving him, it says here, is to believe. You've got to believe in his name. You've got to believe that Jesus was God's son. You've got to believe that God sent him. You've got to believe that, God, that he was human, that he was fully God and fully human, that he came to die on a cross for your sin. That's what you've got to believe. And if you believe that, that's a good start. Then you've got to receive him into your life. You know, today, we have a bunch of great volunteers, and they, 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 they made something for you. This is a Christmas ornament. My wife's been doing this since we started the church years ago. She decided every Christmas uh, we're going to make a Christmas ornament for everybody. Back then we'd, we'd make 50 and then eventually the church grew and we made 75 and then 100 and then 150. And, and this, week, this weekend, we, this week, they, that's taken them several weeks, but they made over 1,000 of these now. And there's one for every one of you. This is, this is our gift to you. It's got a little light in it. It's an Christmas ornament you can hang on your tree if you have one. We don't even have a tree at our house yet. But uh, this is our gift to you. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter if we got a gift for you. It's not your gift until you what? Receive it. That's right. you got to receive it. If you don't receive the gift, then you're going to leave here empty-handed and you won't have the gift. And that's why you got to just be sure to stop by as you walk out of this, these doors today. Stop by, look for, for some of our, our, um, our helpers out there. Or stop by that Christmas tree. It's all lit up with these, these ornaments. And stop by and just get your gift. It's free. It's just our gift to you. It's to remind you that you are here. Just something to remind you that, that God loves you. That you are the light. That Jesus is the light. Again, same thing with Jesus. Jesus is the gift to you. And he's been out there maybe all these years. He's been out there. And, and maybe it's the first time you've come to church. Maybe this is the first time you heard that Jesus is a gift to you. He came at Christmas. Christmas isn't about Sandy. It's about Jesus coming to planet Earth to die for you. Today, will you receive him? Will you receive him into your heart? It's the best thing you can ever do. I'd like to lead you in a prayer right now. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? Maybe you're here today and you've never received God's gift. God has a gift for you. The greatest gift you could ever receive at Christmas or on any other occasion. The greatest gift. And that's his son who came to planet earth. Fully God, fully man. He could have come in a whirlwind. He could have come in a blaze of glory. But God said, no, I'm going to let him come as a man so he could die. And he did. Died on a cross for your sins so that you don't have to allow sin to continue to suck the life out of you. But you can have a new life. 
You can be a brand new person, but you got to receive the gift. Today, will you receive the gift? Here's how you do that. You simply tell them, God, I received the gift. Will you, will you just pray this prayer with me? If you'd like to receive his gift, pray this prayer. Dear, dear God, today I want to receive your gift. Today you've opened my eyes and you've helped me to see that you gave me this gift, the gift of eternal life, the gift of your love, the gift of forgiveness for all my sins. And today I want to receive the gift of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you to come into my life. I'm not asking you to make me religious. I'm asking you to give me a relationship with you. I receive you into my heart. Make me the person you want me to be and forgive me of all my sins. I receive your gift. (laughs) And I thank you, God, for Jesus. I hope you just prayed that prayer with me. If you did, you've received the gift. It's yours now. Jesus is in your heart. That's the greatest thing you can ever do. Father, I know that there are people in this room today. And for some, circumstantially, it's going to be the worst Christmas they've ever had because some of the things that went on this year. And Father, for all those (laughs) who are hurting, God, for all those whose hearts are broken, for all those who are without jobs or all those who are without, with, you know, love, relationships, family, whatever it is that they feel like they're lacking. God, will you touch their hearts? Will you help them to know that Christmas is not about those things, but it's about you, and they can still have a Merry Christmas. Wrap your loving arms around them, Father, and I pray that you will help every single one of us to focus, to to think this Christmas about the great gift you've given us. As we focus on you, as we think about you, Let us have a Merry Christmas. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.